I see. More's the pity. Surrendering thyself into the surface of a dull witch is not as frightful as thou fearest. Hey guys, Thingfishy here, and welcome to episode 2 of the Starting Class series. In this series, I'm taking each of the starting classes through the game and seeing how powerful I can make them, while sticking to the starting equipment classes. And this week is the Prisoner, which creates a dilemma. The Prisoner starts with a staff, and if I was chasing the highest damage numbers and the most overpowered build, I could grab Night Comet, Karin Slicer or Comet Azure and just melt everything. But I wanted to make a proper prisoner build using both magic and melee. And this seemed like the perfect opportunity to make a highly requested frost build as well as doing a full run with a spell I've only discovered very recently, Adula's Moonblade. To get started I followed my standard setup guide for all of the flasks and upgrade materials. You only need the smithing stones for this build. So we pick up the action here in Limgrave. Head south from the gate front, over the bridge and into this camp to grab the Royal House scroll from on top of this building. Now to the castle rampart grace in Weeping and up the spirit spring to grab the starlight shards. Then do the same from the South Argyll Lake Grace. Next head to the Carian Study Hall in Leonia. Up the first two sets of stairs to grab our staff for the run, the Carian Glintstone Staff. Ride to the Boil Prawn Shack in Leonia and ride southwest to grab the Dex Tier. Now to the Grace by EG. Drop down the cliffs and ride north for the Intelligence Knot tier. From the Altus Highway Grace, ride north to drop down and grab the Amber Starlight for later. Next ride south from the Third Church of Marica and down the lift into Sifra. Ride through the river until you find this broken pillar. Up it and through the teleporter on top so that we can grab Marika's scar seal from under the waterfall. Now the prisoner has a small shield, which is really good for parries. But if you want an even easier time, head to Caria Manor for Loretta. You can run into the corner of her arena and quit out to disable her AI. This is a nice way of getting this Ash of War early on any build. But the real reason that we're here is for another Ash of War. Head south from Renner's Rise into these ruins to kill the scarab for an early frost infusion. We're going to be using a few infusions on the Estoc in this run, but this one, despite not quite scaling as well as a magic infusion, is generally my preference due to the frost damage. While we're here, head into the secret cellar near Rani's Rise to check out Celevis's dungeon. This is required for his quest later on. Now for some runes, warp to Renna's Rise 
and jump onto the side of the bridge and quit out in front of this hole in the wall. Most of the time, the knight's cavalry will jump at you as you spawn in, but quit out quickly if he does something else. Now to Fort Farrah, to kill the sleepy dragon with the morning star and the bleed grease, using a foul foot after the final hit. Now because we're going to level two smithing stone weapons on this run, we need as many runes as possible. So head to the Kalid Tower to get the Newman rune on the furthest left platform. So as well as buying all the smithing stone threes and fours from the setup that we need, we also need another 12 of each of them. So pop all the runes you have on you. Spending this amount of runes early does seem painful, but our build won't suffer too much because of those extra golden runes. Level the staff to plus 16, as that's going to be our main source of damage for the early game. And the stock to plus 13. Now it's time for Margit. You want to cast Chilling Mist at the start of every fight for some frostbite. And now let's talk about thrusting swords. There's two really good options for this build, the Estoc and the Rapier. The Rapier has lower base damage, less range, but much better critical hits, so it's a really good one for parry. I went with the starting Estoc because I've never used it before, but you can't go wrong with either. Now for Godric, and I just went with R1s for this fight. The Estoc will proc Frost pretty quickly with R1s, and the attacks are fast enough to give you plenty of time to dodge. Just don't let this knowledge turn you into a greed monster that gets hit more than usual because of this, like me. Now again, I'm going to head straight to Radan, but if you're relatively new to the game, I'd recommend heading to Rhea Lucaria first. We need to go there later in the run anyway, but it will give you a little bit more vigour before the big man. Before that though, we're going to need to do a lot more damage. So from the first step in Limgrave, head into Argyll Lake and down into the Dragonburn Ruins to be abducted to the Celia Crystal Tunnel. Get out of there sharpish and ride out into the lake. Heading west to the streets of Sage's Ruins for Rock Sling in the cellar. Then ride south to grab the meteorite staff from the corpse on this building. Now head back to Rani's Rise. Speak to her and the boys. Then head over to speak to Celevus in his rise. We've got all the items needed for the questline, so buy the jar puppet, then keep quitting out until new dialogue appears. Eventually, he'll tell you about his scheme and give you the magic scorpion charm. Now ride north up the eastern coast of Leonia, grabbing 1500 runes on your way to the Church of Vows. Say hi to Muriel and buy Karian Slicer from him. Now to the Minor Erd Tree in the same area for the Magic Shrouding tier. Karian Slicer and Roxling are basically a cheat code for the early game on any imp build, depending on whether or not you want to go ranged or melee. I'm being slightly predictable in using them, but that's because we want to get a Jeweler's Moonblade as early as possible. Now we're ready for Radan, and with Kari and Slicer, it's really not too bad at all. We're not quite as strong as we've been on those silly 9 Vigor int builds, but we can also take some hits. If you spam Slicer throughout all of his scripted attacks, and the slow attack after his phase 2 landing, you'll only have to fight him for that last bit of health at the end of the fight. Our next step is fully completing Rani's questline, 
so back to Limgrave and down into the crater. Head all the way through Nokron and grab the Finger Slayer Blade from the Night's Sacred Ground. Speaking to Rani after this will unlock Renner's Rise, where you can grab some super cool fashion and head into Ainsel River. Head through all of the areas, speaking to miniature Rani at a grace. Then we have to deal with Blyde, who would usually be a real problem. But stand in the entrance and spam Roxling, and despite our damage being so low, keep spamming and he'll never get close enough to hit you. Now we're going to drop back to Rayo Lucaria for a couple of items. Just before Red Wolf, hit the invisible wall on the left. Head into the room and grab Comet from the chest. Then up the ladder and into the next room to grab the Graven School Talisman. I actually forgot this talisman existed on this playthrough and used the in one instead, so your damage will be slightly better than mine on the sorceries. Now we have to beat Astal. And doing this fight so early was a concern, as Roxling and Corian Slicer aren't that great for it. Comet is really good for this fight. By playing it slow and only casting when it's safe, you'll have an easy early Astor. To finish off the quest line, we need to get to Renala. So if you haven't done so already, head into Rare Lucaria for Red Wolf. And this fight is incredibly easy. This fight is incredibly easy with these stats. For Anala, Roxling is the best option, as her magic resistance renders pretty much everything else useless. So, Adula's Moonblade. Back in December, while I was filming my Ultimate Int video, which I eventually shelved because I thought it was a little bit too predictable, this spell was one of the few surprises. I ended up being one spell short, and I figured that this obscure frost sorcery might work well for Fire Giant. It turns out that it's pretty ridiculous for everything. I'm not the first person to notice this, but I was surprised that I hadn't heard more about it based on how good it is. To get it, we need to fight the Magic Dragon, who is fine if you just spam Roxling, until she does this attack, which is basically Elden Stars, but less fun, and it one-shots you, and how the fuck am I meant to dodge that? Thinking about this afterwards, I think something that might work is doing a stationary dismount of Torrent. I think those iframes would be enough to save you from the whole attack. Someone try it and let me know if it works in the comments. So instead of letting this game take more of my sanity, I went with the cheesy method. Stand near the building and cast Roxlet. By doing this, you can always hide behind something for Frosty Elden Stars. So finally, we have our build. Adula's Moonblade is basically a spell version of the Moonlight Greatsword, but without the obvious benefits of a melee weapon. And it absolutely deletes health bars. If spamming a spell isn't that exciting, you can switch to your shield and use your Frost S-Dock to play pure melee. I really like this kind of build. You can brush up on your boss movesets with melee, knowing that you can completely delete the boss with your magic as soon as you get bored.
For Godfrey, you have a choice based on your knowledge of his moveset. If you're newer to the game, stick to the S-Doc for the most forgiving fight. If you know what you're doing, you can use the S-Doc between the quicker attacks and use Adula's Moonblade for the bigger openings. To fill the final talisman slot, I headed north from the Outer Plateau Grace to the Lux Ruins and killed the Demi-Human Queen for the Ritual Sword Talisman. For Morgoth, I started off with some parries. Doing the whole fight with the Estoc and parries would certainly be the path to ultimate satisfaction, but if you want to bully him, wait until he starts casting the dagger attacks and hit him with Moonblade. Those big slow blood attacks in phase two provide excellent opportunities for Moonblade casts. And if you want to attack at range for an even easier time, you can do that too. Keep hold of Morgoth's runes as you head up to the mountaintops. Head into the Zamor ruins and down into the cellar for the Smithing Bell Bearing 3. Take this back to the round table for 12 smithing fives for the S-Doc and an eye-watering 24 smithing sixes. While this will get both weapons to plus 18, we want a little more power for our star. So continue through the mountaintops to the freezing lake grace where you can bait the nearby golem into hitting this rock for some smithing sevens. Then ride round the lake to the first church of Marica for more on the cliff nearby. Head back to EG for a plus 18 S stock and a plus 20 staff. Adula's Moonblade makes the Fire Giant fight so easy. Don't get me wrong, it's not ridiculous damage, but the way it constantly chips away from his health means that the fight is over before you're in any real peril. Head through Farum all the way to the Dragon Temple Transept Grace. Now right from the start of this run, I'd resigned myself to the fact that Godskin Duo would probably be a straight up parry fight with the S-Doc, as Moonblade doesn't have the stagger damage for the normal sleep strap. But before settling in for a festival of memes with the S-Doc, I thought I'd give it a try. And yeah, it really doesn't need the stagger damage. If you're really scared of duo, you can keep chucking sleep pots to avoid the fight entirely, but the damage from a doula is really good. And finally, after heading back to the giant skull in the mountaintops for an ancient dragonstone and buying 18 smithing sevens, and 24 smithing 8s, we can level our staff to max and our S-Doc to plus 24. I never bothered maxing the S-Doc, but if you want to, there's another ancient dragonstone on this ledge right after Duo. You get to it by just running up the stairs. For Draconic, I tried the build I promised myself this run wouldn't turn into, parrying an Adula's Moonblade. It's immensely satisfying, powerful, and certainly the way I'd play with this equipment if I wasn't doing a prisoner build. For Beast, I wanted some extra damage for my melee attacks, so I went back to Rail Lucaria to grab the Glintstone Wetblade. Infusing the S-Doc with magic will give you higher base damage but no frost buildup. 
It's a good shout for enemies immune to frost, not the beast is. Or if you want all of your frost damage to be done by the spell. Most of the time, I don't think it's worth it, but the option is there. The quick attacking Estoc is perfect for beast, allowing you to capitalize on even the smallest opening. The spear talisman would give you a good boost in damage here too, if you were going pure melee. For Malaketh, Moonblade all the way. And now another roadblock for this build I'd been anticipating from the start approached. Old wanky McSpamalot. But actually... For Godfrey, treat it exactly the same as the Shade. Estoc for safety, Moonblade for the style points. And unfortunately, with the S-Stock, we're definitely not going to be able to stagger Horalu at the start of Phase 2. Now head to Fort Gale in Caelid. Just in front of the Grace, there's an invisible scarab you can kill for the flame of the Red Mane's Ash of War. If you've been playing Elden Ring for a while, this will remind you of the good old days. Today though, we only want this Ash of War for a fire infusion. So this is another way that you could run this build and it makes a lot of sense for a boss with a massive health bar like Plassey. The idea is to proc Frost with Adula's Moonblade, then instantly reset the Frost with the Fire Estoc so you can proc it again. This is super effective. The downside to this, and the reason I only use this setup for a couple of fights, is it turns the Estoc into a one-use accessory, rather than an actual weapon. If you wanted to do this on a full run, I'd just buy a torch for 500 runes from Kale and save yourself the 100k on smithing stones. Now to Castle Soul for Commander Nile. The Estoc sadly doesn't one-shot the summons like a lot of weapons do, but Moonblade is still very, very good. Going for parries with the Estoc would probably take a while, so after dodging the big tornado attack and deleting most of his health with Moonblade, I had a little mid-fight switch around and went for parries and Moonblade for the rest of his health bar.
right through the snowfields all the way to Ordner Town. Then southwest from there and through the teleporter into Mogwin's Palace. For Moog, I bought out the fire restock again, as Moonblade was going to be doing all the heavy lifting in this fight. Despite having a bit of a shocker here, the spell was more than good enough to get me out of trouble and see off the Lord of Blood. As the spell and parry setup had worked really well for the Draconic Sentinel, I wanted to try it out on Loretta. And once again, very satisfying and very powerful. The one thing I'd mention is don't let your head trick you into thinking a stagger is coming with this spell. I got hit so many times in this run because my brain was thinking Moonlight Greatsword rather than Karian Slicer. For the last two bosses, I went back to the original build for the Prisoner experience. The Frost Estoc is great for fights like Melania and Radagon, because you can keep Frost progged, even in hectic moments where you can't get Moonblades in. For Melania, parry her three times, take the riposte, then swap to Moonblade for one to three hits. Just be aware anything more than one here puts you at the mercy of Waterfowl RNG. For Radagon, I followed the same approach, and his attacks do give you a little bit more room for Moonblade if you want to bully him. And that's it, how to make a super fun and super powerful prisoner build. Next week, we take a look at the Vagabond. And if you like silly damage and bullying bosses, you won't want to miss that one. If you try this build, please let me know how you get on in the comments. As always, thanks for watching. See you soon.